Um, so before we um, listen to Rich um, share his talk with us, um, I just wanted to, we, well, we wanted to say that it's really good uh, to have our new church prayer moments, I call them, or times, prayer times, <laughs> throughout the week. Um, and part, well, the first one was uh, this morning at nine o'clock, so people can come a bit earlier on a Sunday and have that time to pray together. And there are a few throughout the week as well. <clears throat> But I thought uh, I would share uh, some of, we, th we could share some of our prayer experiences together to encourage each other how prayer works. Um, might have to wait a short time, might have to wait a long time in prayer, but it's good to share our stories together. And uh, the first one, I just thought I'd kick us off. <laughs> And then maybe invite us, um, if anybody wants to come and um, share what God is doing for them this week and um, in their prayer time. Um, I'd just like to say that Tim and I are so grateful for everyone who prayed for us um, uh, when Toby was in hospital. And he's had his recent third cardiac surgery and was home in five days. <laughs> and everyone kept saying wow, that's really quick. And I was sitting there going, it's the prayer. The prayer works. And it's, I thought it was important to, to if I feel confident, to, to tell people that. It's because people are praying and God is looking after him. I completely believe that. But I, I also believe, um, I just had a, a reflection on that. I also believe that God was there um, in, in my suffering um, and I think he's there when we suffer so we can meet others in their suffering too and bring Jesus to them with, with the comfort that he was there with me, he can also be there with you. And it um, made me think of a passage, I had to try and find where it was, but it's 2 Corinthians 1, 4, it says, He comes alongside us when we suffer in hard times. And then he brings us alongside someone else who is suffering. So we can comfort them just as God was there for us. That's so important. So that's my um, story. If um, anyone else wants to come up and stand beside me and just give a bit of uh, an account of how prayers will help them in their life or particularly what God is doing for them this week. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, you're right. Speaking to that, so they can hear. As many of you, most of you know, Peter had cancer two years ago and he was healed from it. And he just went for his appointment this week. And they said his kidneys would never go up above 35% and they're 42% now. So and he's a lot better than he was. And, uh, and Joy, just to ask you, um, did you, did you, do you pray alone about that or do you pray together? What, what does that feel like with, when God is going through that with you? We just rejoice that it's happened really. Yeah. You okay if we pray for you now? Lord... Lord Jesus, um, I can feel you shaking. Well, first of all, thank you that um, Joy had the confidence to come up and share that because it really renews our um, belief as well in you. Thank you that we're feeling safe, that we can share each other's stories together and gives us that little push, that bravery. We thank you so much that... Uh, a miracle happened in during um, Peter's treatment. We pray for them as a family. Pray for Joy and Peter as they go through this together. Pray the, for um, safety and warmth in their home. And we pray for them together in their daily lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you. Scripture too. Yeah. 
too. Yeah, um, yeah, for myself, I don't want to stand here and say what exactly God has done, but by prayer, God has answered a load of our prayers within the family in all sorts of ways and amazing ways, even to the point that our son's been made redundant from his job. And he's actually just texted me to say, I'm really delighted because it wasn't a job that he was particularly encouraged by. It was to do with his vaping. Um, but it was a job that the Lord gave him some years ago. But now he's just got to look for a new job. And he knows even today that he'll have to wait in God's timing. So he's just texted through to say that um, I'm hoping by February I get a job. So who knows? He's in his 40s. So that will be our prayer. But before I looked at that, I was looking at the Philippians 4, um, verse 6, which God says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, last week I went up and actually Joel prayed for me. And there was loads of things with family going through my mind. And I thought, you know, when we have these opportunities for people to come up and pray with you, please take them up because it's not just our own prayer at home. It's actually good to have someone else praying with you. So should that come up in a service or anything, I would encourage everyone to take that opportunity because I'm just a changed person. And God certainly answered our prayers this week. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Claire. Um, so this week, um, obviously, I've been doing lots of feeding with Asher, ho- holding him in my arms and just looking at him. He's got really big eyes when he's feeding and he just looks at you like, don't look away. So I'm sort of drawn into looking at him. And um, uh, as Emma had said to me, you know, just take that time to pray for him. So I've been praying lots for him and uh, that's lovely. But I'm also sort of praying wider as well when I pray. And then there are other times when I'm really, really tired and I completely forget to pray. <laughs> And I really felt this week God saying, you know how you're holding this baby in your arms? Well, I'm holding you in exactly the same way. Um, And all these emotions that you're feeling about your newborn baby is exactly what I feel about you. You're you're cared for, you're loved. Um, And yeah, I just felt that prayer is, we can come to God with a petition, but it's actually a way for him to speak to us um, and share some of what he's thinking towards us. Can we pray for you as a family? Lord, um, we pray for the Brightwells, Claire, Luke, Carl and little Asher. We thank you so much um, for the gift that Claire has and the perception that she and the ability to sit and dwell and just take time when she's... um, giving Asher his milk to to feel that, that you're holding her too. We pray for them um, in their daily, hourly, minute by minute times with a new baby. And we thank you for the joy um, that he brings them. And we thank you that he's really gluing together the family and uh, I mean, I saw the other day how uh, amazing the big brother Carl is <laughs> with him and uh, does all the big brother things like um, tickles and laughs that maybe parents, I don't know, they don't do or they don't, uh, y- you know, it's a different sibling relationship. We thank you that Asha has that in his life and that you are growing that family. We pray for um, Luke as he goes to work and that he um, feels you at work and can concentrate on the importance there and then can wash that off and come home and uh, (laughs) I often you walk in the house and um, here have the baby kind of thing (laughs) Um, and so we pray in the in just the I don't know it's like the little stressful times and uh, the joyous times, the calm times, sitting together as a family and that they can all have, um, feel your, your sense that you're with them. Amen. Amen. Do you know the 
the icy, the ra rabbit right. yesterday. So, so yesterday, so yesterday, um, I think it was last weekend or week before, uh, there was next door rabbit. I thought it got run over and I thought, oh no, what's going to happen? So when I read the Bible in, in John, it says to save the animals and the and listen to the birds and stuff. But I, lucky enough, the car wasn't there, but I saved it because I have, I'm allergic to guinea pigs and rabbits. And I had to go with a member of staff to take it to Kate Chum. Kate Chum, I did, to, to the vets. And they know who it is. And this, la this lady, nurse, was so kind and nice and she noticed who it was coming from and know who house it was so then I knocked on the door my house my staff Sandra Lang who's not he yeah he she's been a little bit ill nurse this week but she supported me with that rabbit and stuff and I felt God I say God, thank you for saving that ra rabbit, and I and I feel welcome to save it as well, and listen to God more, a lot more God for the world I got really, and I'm so shocked that I saw it, and I'm very sure about that, and hope it doesn't happen again. Can, I, can we say a prayer for you? Yeah. Oh. That's oh, so wonderful. Thank you, uh, Lord, for um, Ziggy. He, when he sees a rabbit in distress, he the first thing he thinks about, or first thing that comes to his mind, is reading, and he thinks about you, Lord. Um, I wonder if we can reflect: Do we all do the same in a crisis? Do we all immediately, maybe we do, think about and pray to God? Um, we thank you so much for his complete trust in you and the gift that he has um, in caring for animals and you've got such a gift caring with children and others. And we pray that um, you are with him this week in whatever he has to do. Amen. Amen. Well done. Anyone? Um, I'm here to tell you that prayer works, and um, I'm a product of prayer. So one of which that I want to share with us today was that um, when we are given notice to leave the house we were in, and um, that really worried me. And um, what we said in our family was that we wanted a place that was close to where we live. and. Um, in one of the prayer meetings in the church and uh, also in our Bible group meetings, I shared my worries and um, we prayed about that and it worked. And I got a house just close to where I live. Thank you. Would you like to pray about that? Lord, we thank you so much because um, anytime we are worried about anything you said um, we should not worry about anything but rather we should pray and we thank you when we ask you you are always there to hear us and to answer our prayers thank you in Jesus name thank you maybe one, one more Um, oh, I've come to share something that um, Bly's prayed about, actually, but I know she won't mind me sharing on, on her behalf. Um, it started um, back in New Wine in the summer, which was torrential rain, but great things came out of it. Um, we heard a, a speaker saying, flex your faith and faith is action and start small. You grow, your, grow your spiritual muscles and 
um, you know, you won't raise someone from the dead. You've got you to gotta get there. You've got to um, practice. And the same teaching was taught in the children's groups. And they were told um, or encouraged to um, pray and ask God for pictures, which has really taken seed in Blythe's heart. And she will do that over anything, not, not just... Um, particular things about how much God loves her or something quite abstract. Anyway, so this story is about a few weeks ago we were going to the Lake District and I was packing and it's October so it's going to be pitch black by the time it's four o'clock in the afternoon and Arthur got given a little head torch which is going to be so so useful but could I find it the night before? I could not. I ransacked the whole house and it was our only torch and I knew that it had batteries and I also knew that we'd be definitely going to the pub and coming out of it after 4pm so I was like we need this <laughs> we need this this head torch and it was the morning the morning that we were leaving and um, I gathered the children I was like Blythe <laughs> you ask God for pictures <laughs> I was like can you ask God for a picture can you ask him where this head torch is it's, it's like it's about an inch square it's the tiniest with with elastic around the head it's the tiniest thing I was at my wits end <laughs> and um, so we had a little pray just me uh, Dan was loading the car, me and the kids, and I was like, Blythe, you lead this. Um, and so she, we carried on looking, we prayed, N- nothing, nothing religious, just, Lord, please give me a picture of where the head torch is. And uh, we all said our men and carried on looking. So I was like, we have to keep looking, we can't just stop, we've got to keep looking. <laughs> and, then, and then out of nowhere, and she was saying, Mummy, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't got anything, I don't know where this is. And then she goes, I do know, I do know, I've seen a picture of the wooden till. Now we've got this pretend toy till that we play with shops, and it's got a little drawer and it's got little buttons and a calculator. And so we went and got this till, and we opened the drawer, and lo and behold, inside the drawer <laughs> is the head torch. And then Arthur goes, oh yeah, I used it as money yesterday. <laughs> but... Um, it's a really small thing. It's a really small thing. It's like praying for a parking space sometimes. You think, oh God, do you, do you care? Or, or should I ask you to care about this? But it's also a really big thing that a child came before a heavenly father and asked for help and got tangible help. And we then immediately prayed and thanked God for that. And when we were using our head torch in the holiday, we remembered it. And it's a big thing for our family that Blythe had a word from the Lord. And she shared that with people and she shared it with her family. And um, I as well, I'm so encouraged about that. So I thought I would share that with you. Can you say thank you to God for your prayer? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Lord, thank you that you are the God of, of the big things and the God of the little things. And nothing, nothing is too small. You know, um, you know, when a bird falls from the sky, you know the number of hairs on our head. And um, I pray for us all that we would all be encouraged by uh, the faith of a child, um, that we, we would also be able to come to you and, and, and ask uh, for pictures and words of wisdom um, and know that you answer and know that it doesn't always happen straight away, um, but that you do answer and that your heart is to have a relationship where it's not just us petitioning up, but there is, there is um, relationship coming back down to us. Um, and I thank you, Lord, for answering Blythe's prayer. Amen. Thank you. That was such a valuable time. Rich, would you like to come and share with us? Actually, before I say anything, Habila's going to come and read to us uh, from the Bible. So, uh, Habila, would you like to come up? Matthew, Matthew chapter 25 from verse 1 to 13. Matthew chapter 25 from verse 1 to 13. I read from NIV, page 994. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, 
and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lambs, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lambs. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lambs. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lambs are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the orders also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you don't know the day or the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Habila. Um, I'm just going to pray before I say anything more. Thank you, Father God, for your word. Thank you that this is all about you. I can't say anything that will make any difference, but it's your power at work. Uh, through me, I pray for your spirit to speak to us, that you would uh, draw us nearer to you, that we become more like you, and be transformed into your image. Amen. Amen. Well, wake up. Wake up and stay awake. That's what I want to talk about today. Uh, so if you are sleeping, starting to feel a bit drowsy, uh, no pressure, but you've got to stay awake. And uh, I'm, I'm actually talking uh, spiritually mainly, but I, it would be quite nice if you did actually stay awake. Uh, and uh, I won't take it too personally if you do fall asleep. But, you know, it's more encouraging when people are concentrating and, uh, and awake. Uh, now, um, I don't know whether you're find, like me, finding it kind of harder in the mornings to get up out of bed. It's cold out of bed, isn't it? Uh, it's getting much more difficult. Uh, I've, I've been um, sort of meaning uh, to buy uh, one of those alarm clocks that wakes you up with a, a really nice radio station, maybe like Classic FM or something smooth and relaxing. Uh, and I just... Don't get round to it. So at the moment, I've got um, I've got my alarm on my phone, and uh, I, some of these alarm sounds are a bit a bit sort of abrupt and abrasive. Um, let's just let's just check out what we've got here. So, well, that's quite a nice one. That's called Bulletin, <laughs> and we've got Circuit. I'm not sure I want to wake up to that. Cosmic. Wake up thinking you're in Star Wars. Uh, what else have we got? Presto. That's a that's one of those uh, abrupt, abrasive ones that I don't put on my phone. I have to make sure I change that later. Um, otherwise, tomorrow morning is going to be fun. But you know, this this morning we're reading uh, the bit in uh, Matthew's Gospel. The section where Jesus is starting to talk about the time when he's coming back. And we have, we have earlier, just, just before the reading that Habila read to us, um, Jesus is, is using various different parables, different stories to help us, uh, help us learn that we need to stay awake, that we need to be watchful, we need to be uh, aware that he is coming back. And in verse, in verse 20, 42 sorry, of 20, chapter 24, 
Uh, Jesus says, keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming an unexpected hour. So Jesus first says, stay awake, like be ready, be watchful. Jesus is coming and we don't know when. And, uh, and then we've got this, this interesting story. And in your Bibles, uh, it uses the word virgins. But um, in other translations, it uses the word bridesmaids uh, to tell this story about these five bridesmaids who were ready with oil and five bridesmaids who weren't ready with their oil. And they all had these lamps to help them see. Because um, back then, in, in this tradition of the time, uh, weddings would take place at night. And they would take place in the, in the bride's house. And so the bride's party, the bridesmaids would go to the bride, bride's house and, uh, and wait for the bridegroom to come to the bride's house. And uh, they were expecting the, the bridegroom to arrive at a certain time, but it says that he was delayed. Uh, and they all fell asleep. They all fell asleep. They hadn't read what Jesus had just talked about. It's about staying awake. They'd missed it. Uh, but uh, they'd fallen asleep. Uh, but then Jesus talks about there being at midnight a shout. Look, the bridegroom is here. Come out to meet him. And those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. And uh, the foolish ones, the five who hadn't brought any oil with them, suddenly realised, uh-oh, we haven't got any oil. We can't see anything. We're not ready to go to, to join the wedding because this is happening at night time, remember. They didn't have electricity, so they relied on these oil lamps. And then there were five who were ready. They'd come prepared. They were, they were watchful. They were ready and prepared with their oil. And it says that the five who were ready went in and enjoyed the wedding and the five who weren't ready uh, had to go off and find oil from somewhere. And by the time they got the oil, they came back and the wedding had kind of begun and it was all going and they, just, they weren't allowed in. And this is a, a, a story that Jesus tells with a, quite a, a um, harsh message in it, actually. Uh, but there's two things I want to draw out today. One is that uh, there's going to be a wedding. This is a, a parable, but which is a, a symbolic story. But actually, throughout the Bible, we have this this um, this symbol, this picture of a wedding that's going to happen between uh, the bride of Christ, that is the church, and the bridegroom, who is Jesus. And one day we will we will be invited to that wedding as the bride of Christ. We're invited because we are meant to be the bride. Now, for, for, for ladies here, you've got to get used to being sons of God. And for gentlemen, we've got to get used to being the bride. Okay? Jesus says that he's the one who's coming back. He's coming back for his bride. And if you're asleep or you're not ready when he comes, then you're not coming in, is the message in this story. So are we awake for this wedding? Are we ready? You see, you can't be a Christian on your own. The bride of Christ is a group of people. It's not just an individual. It's a church. We are are the bride. We are his bride here in Twerton. So what kind of bride do we want to be found to be when Jesus comes back, when the bridegroom returns to invite us to the wedding? When there's that shout saying, here he is, he's coming. How do we want to be found? What kind of church do we want to be? If Jesus returned today, because it, the Bible says we don't know the hour, we, we don't know when it's going to be. It could be today. How would you live today differently if you knew that he was coming later this afternoon, for instance? What would you be sad about or sorry about if he returned today? Maybe thinking 
oh, I didn't get around to doing that. I was, re- I was saving up money to go on that trip or hadn't found Mr. or Mrs. Wright yet or whatever it might be that you've been hoping and dreaming of. What would you be sorry or sad about if Jesus returned today? That might indicate, it might shed some light on what you are worshipping, on what's most important to you. Are you living the dream? We all have dreams, don't we? We all have hopes and dreams. But what about if you're living the dream meant that you're actually asleep? We all dream when we're asleep, don't we? But are we awake to the reality of God's kingdom? Is God's kingdom the most exciting, the most amazing thing that you're living for? Or is it some other dream? And just church kind of fits in as a nice sort of part of your life. Sort of an add-on to make you feel like you're living a good life. It can be easy to just fall into the trap of just being a half asleep Christian. I know, I know I feel that temptation myself. You see, the king comes twice. The Bible talks about the king coming once when Jesus was born in a stable, grew up to become the saviour of the world. But he came looking for voluntary surrender the first time. He came sort of bringing his good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God, of an invitation to come and be part of this bride. But he didn't force anyone. He didn't come with power and the authority of kings and queens and emperors at the time with an army. That's what they were expecting. But Jesus came as a suffering servant, inviting people to join if they wanted. Not putting pressure and force, but looking for voluntary surrender. But the king comes twice. And the Bible talks about him coming the second time and he comes with a sword. There are lots of different images of the returning king, the return of the king. And the second time he comes, he's coming to judge the living and the dead. He's coming as the bridegroom looking for his bride, looking for a bride who is awake and ready. And if they're not ready and they're not awake, then they're not coming in. Now, I just, I was thinking the first few talks I give here should be kind of really soft and really gentle and uh, hopefully you'd all fall in love with me and think, oh, he's such a wonderful vicar and he just makes us feel good. And, um, and uh, I just, we're so pleased we went for him and not the other two. And uh, I'm sorry, but this is the passage I've been given. <laughs> Joel, thanks. <laughs> it's so easy to skip over these difficult passages in the Bible, isn't it? We we want to go to the passages where Jesus invites the little children or when he comes and embraces the the sick and the lame. They're They're the good passages. That's what I could have done with Joel. I would have been the popular vicar then. But now I've got to preach about judgment and people not getting in. People not being ready. But This is what Jesus has said. We don't just get to pick and choose. The king comes twice. Firstly, looking for voluntary surrender. And we're in that season now, guys. We are in the season of voluntary surrender. Have you voluntarily surrendered your all to him? That's what he's looking for. He's looking for a bride who willingly gives herself to him. Not a bride who by compulsion and is sort of forced into it. And when Jesus is coming back, he's looking for the bride who has voluntarily surrendered herself to him. And all those who have chosen not to will experience a very different destiny. Now this is the talk when I can share all my wedding stories that are completely inappropriate for a wedding service. 
my dad is also a vicar. And when I was growing up, I remember him as a curate uh, doing one of his first weddings. And uh, poor guy, he, the, one of his, his first weddings was uh, a, a really difficult one. There had been a, a threat, a, a threatening letter sent to the couple, uh, threatening uh, that a bomb would go off at the wedding. And there was some uh, feud in the family, I think, and uh, possibly some mental health uh, issues going on as well. And, and so there was this um, threat of a bomb at the wedding, and the couple had to decide, do we go ahead and get married or not? Do we go ahead with the wedding? And they decided that they would. And of course, the police were involved. There were undercover officers everywhere. And my poor dad had to, had to take this wedding at every moment thinking, what's going to happen? Especially that slightly awkward pause in the wedding where, where you say, is there any reason <laughs> why this couple may not be married? Awkward pause, phew, no bomb. And... Uh, Fortunately, the wedding went, went smoothly, but there, there was a lot of careful awareness, careful vetting about who got to come to the wedding. Only those, only those who were there to support, only those who were trusted were welcomed in. So whilst we may be confident about the outcome on Judgment Day for ourselves, if we, as Dan uh, spoke a few weeks ago, for us as Christians, we know the end of the story. We know that Jesus wins. We know that we are saved. That we know that we are in Christ. We know that when it comes to Judgment Day, Jesus will take the hit for you. He took the hit on the cross. When your sin is exposed, Jesus says, I took it. I took it on me. This one, he's, on, he's in me. The end of the story, we know the outcome. But are we going to be the, the glorious bride? The glorious bride who is ready for his return? Will we be awake or asleep when he returns? You see, the Holy Spirit is preparing us, making us ready for the return of the King. And this, this work of making us ready or holy uh, is a word that's used in the Bible. It's a word called sanctification. It's a, um, a word that means being made ready for Jesus. Being made holy for Jesus. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. Sanctification, getting ready, it's not something you can do. It's the work of God in you. But are you welcoming him to do that work in you? Are you living some other dream or are you awake and ready to the Holy Spirit? You see, if you're wondering, oh, I don't really know if I'm awake or I'm, I'm asleep spiritually. Here are some, here are some signs of what uh, being asleep looks like. You're unresponsive. If you're asleep, it's, it's hard to get a response from someone who's asleep, especially a teenager. If you've ever met a teenager who's asleep, it's really hard to wake them up, isn't it? Especially in the morning when you've got to get them up for school. Uh, I, I remember those days. Uh, unresponsive. There's a call to action and you just ignore it. You're too busy to pray. Praying's too hard, it's too loud, it's too quiet. Just leave me in peace. There's a call to action and you just ignore it. I often find uh, prayer meetings are, are hard to start off with, but once, once you start praying, suddenly you start to wake up. Prayer meetings, of course, are the only time in the church's life when we gather just for God. You know, these services are great. I love being here with you now, but there's lots in it for us, isn't there? We get to have nice coffee and tea and biscuits. We get to sing some nice songs, have been led by some great musicians. We get to 
be uh, told some stories that are encouraging. But a prayer meeting is all about God. It's his meeting. He's the main attraction. And we heard some great encouraging stories earlier about prayer, answers to prayer. I was so encouraged. We, we were meant to be having an interview with uh, some people who um, unfortunately couldn't make it today uh, for one reason, reason or another. And so I said to Jen yesterday, why don't we sort of open up the floor to people just to come and share what God's doing in their lives? And it's so encouraging. We had one after another. Sometimes we don't get the answers to prayer that we want. Sometimes we're praying for something and it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen. And that's a, that's a challenge. It's hard to know what to do with that. But I know that we always, always get, the, get one answer. The answer that God wants to give every single time we come and pray. And that's him. He gives himself. Whether you get the answer you want is another question. But he always gives the answer he wants. And that's himself. And an awake church is a praying church. A sleeping church is a church that ignores prayer. The second sign of a sleeping church is an unrepentant people. You know, there's a call to transformation in the Bible, in the gospel, in Jesus' message. It's a call to transformation, to die to your old self, to die to sin. But instead, a sleeping people will choose to live according to how they feel. I don't know if you've ever um, been to a family reunion and your great aunt Ethel says, oh, look, you've grown, or gosh, you've changed. You know, people, people who haven't seen you for a while will notice a difference, will notice a change. But often when you're just living amongst each other, or you're, you, you, you're every, in a daily, daily rhythm of life, you don't notice the change. You don't notice where, whether you're becoming more sleepy or more awake. Whether you're falling back into old patterns of sin, of your old ways of doing life, of living like you feel, or whether you're gradually putting those things to death. It's often only when others who haven't seen you for a while notice and a sleeping church is an unrepentant church, a church who doesn't want to change, who lives according to how they feel. A sleeping church is an uninspired church. You've left others to do the work of discovering God for you, and you're wanting to be fed and looked after. Maybe you're hunting for the best worship music, for great teaching. You can get everything on the internet now. You don't really need to come to church anymore, do you now? You can just uh, listen to all of the, the greatest Hillsong hits and then be inspired by some preacher from America. Coming as a church together in Twerton will involve us inspiring one another. Not leaving the professionals to do it for us. And a sleeping church just leaves others to do it all for them. Waits to be fed. Waits to be looked after. Finally, uh, the last sign of a... I'm sure there are other signs, but the last in my list of a sleeping church is an unaffected church. You hear about the pain and suffering around you, the problems in the world, and you turn over and you leave it to someone else to worry about or just think, well, that's the way it is. Can't change it. C'est la vie. And a sleeping church is an unaffected church. You're not affected anymore by the suffering that you see. So when I look into the future for St. Michael's, what do I hope for us? We're in a season of prayer at the moment. That's why we're increasing the amount of times you can come together to pray. Because I'm asking that question, what kind of church do, do you want us to be, God? And I don't want to be the only one asking the question. I want you all to join me in that question. To seek God, to find out what kind of awake church do you want us to look like, God? What would it 
look like for us to be awakened so that we are the bride who is ready for when Jesus comes back? Well, I, I think at this stage, I can say that I'm hoping for the opposites of what those signs are of a sleeping church. I'm looking for a responsive church, for a responsive people to God who hear his voice, are desperate for more, who at any opportunity to pray are just here, they're on their knees. You're worshipping unabandoned. I, can, I, I, I would love it in years to come to be walking down the streets and just see people worshipping to go wander out up onto the fields and see people just crying out to God. How, when was the last time you had a, a prayer walk or you just worshipped God unabandoned? This morning I got up at six o'clock and it was dark and I, I was trusting that the only, the, only, the only ones that could see me were the cows in the field and I danced around in the dark. It was very liberating. <laughs> Helped me wake up. I see a responsive church. I see a repentant church. A church who are are living transformed lives. A church who are quick to say, sorry, Lord, change me. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. I'm going to choose not to live by how I feel, but to live for you, to live by your word. To live radically different lives in our culture So that in your workplace, people are just looking up, suddenly aware that there's someone very different who lives by a different culture. Your language will change. Your habits will change. A repentant church is an awake church. An inspired church and inspiring each other. We're deeply rooted in God, living lives built on his truth and empowered by his spirit to inspire others. And finally, an awake church. The church I see in the future is a a church affecting change. And we're doing amazing things in this community. Just, I'm so inspired by what I see in the likes of Rose Cottage and in the school and in, in, in what God's doing through our young people. It's really encouraging. But we can do all of that. We can do all of that very easily by just paying others to do it. What if we were all involved in affecting change in this community? What would, what would it look like to make a tangible difference in this community? I think we need to let go of harmful notions that there are those in need and those able to help. The reality is we are all in need and we can all help others. It's not just for some, not just for the pros. We are all in need and we can all help others. We all need to wake up and join in God's mission of awakening others. You see, for revival to come, we need reviving ourselves. And that's what I'm praying for, for us in this season. That we would be revived, woken up, made ready for Jesus' return. Because who knows, he might come back before Christmas. (sighs) These flies all be for nothing. I don't know. Thank you, Joel, for putting them together. But if Jesus returns, then... then, uh, We don't need them. But are we ready? Are we ready? How many flyers can you give out just as a a means of having a conversation about God with someone? Even if we don't get to the Christmas services. Now, as I said before, this reviving, this work of waking us up is the work of God. It's not something you can manufacture or create yourselves in the the book of Revelation I'll finish with this in Revelation chapter 22 the last chapter it says the spirit and the bride the Holy Spirit and the bride of God that's us say come and let the one who hears say come let the one who is thirsty come let the one who wishes to take the free gift of water of life come if I can invite the worship team to come up. There's an invitation now. We haven't got long because children are coming back in and they're going to want to have biscuits. But this is a time to come, to respond, to be a responsive, 
repentant, inspired, affecting change church. Let's stand if you're able. We're just going to take a moment now just to allow God's spirit to awaken our hearts, to quicken our minds, to maybe bring areas in our lives that maybe you, you want to just come and respond. And I'd like, to, I'd like us to do that in a practical way by actually getting out of our places and coming forward if you want to. Or if you're unable to stand and move forward, then you can just raise your hand and someone will come and pray for you. But those who can move, I'd encourage you, if you want to respond, if you want to be awakened by God's Spirit, then to come forward as we sing our uh, final songs. And a number of us would love to pray with you, just to pray for God's Spirit to awaken you. Amen. Joel's going to lead us, but those who want to come and respond, come forward now.